Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Let's uh, get right into the Hebrew apologetic of the week. All right. And then we got some business to, to take care of. Hebrew apologetic of the week. How long was Mashiach's ministry? Shh. If you've been a part of my class or any of my uh, academic settings, or you've been a part of any Hebraic um, settings where we have done um, educational uh, teaching or theological education, please do not answer. But for those who have never heard me teach on this subject matter, I'm engaging you now into the dialogue. How long was Mashiach's ministry? Come on, blurt it out. Don't be scared. For those who are not part of my teaching, did I say that already? Okay. How long was Mashiach's ministry? You ask the average Christian, the average Christian is going to say 3.5 years, three and a half years. Folks, this is a theological invention. It is, it doesn't carry weight. It is incongruous with the Bible. Anybody remember the Bible? Anybody know what the Bible is? So this is old age religious system that has this notion that Mashiach, ministry was three and a half years is a fallacy. It is a doctrine that does not carry weight. As we said before, most people believe what they know, but they do not know what they believe. So what we do is we regurgitate dogma. So when we look at the idea of did Mashiach was his ministry a year and a half, or was it three and a half, was it two and a half? This is an eschatological creation. Eschatology means the end time. This is an eschatological creation that tragically destroys the chronology of the Basores. Now, I'm going to use the term Basora and use gospel interchangeable. For those who are not familiar with the term Basora, you're used to hearing about the four gospel accounts. But what happens is, if we say that Mashiach ministry was three and a half years, do me a favor. I want you to take Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I want you to do whatever you want to it. Because that's essentially what you're doing. We don't follow the chronology of the other gospels. And this has been perpetuated now for 300 years is when they came up with this construct, this fallacy, this doctrine that Mashiach's ministry was only three and a half years. Now, it is important. His death, burial, and resurrection is very important. However, there are some other factors that must be considered when we're looking at his death, burial, and resurrection. His life matters. His ministry matters. Because if we're saying that his ministry was three and a half years, then we are totally ignoring the Old Testament. The Old Testament is full of ancient messianic passages of scripture that points to Yahusha, that points to the Mashiach. In fact, he said, everything you read in the Torah is about me. I am Torah fulfilled in your hearing. Moshe wrote about me, John chapter 5. If you don't believe in the words of Moses, you certainly don't believe in my words because Moses wrote about me. So there are more important factors or additional factors that we must consider when we talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Mashiach. Part of Hebrew apologetics is to release us from the syncretic beliefs or this pagan rituals that we have, that we indoctrinated into our liturgy, we indoctrinated into our doxological worship, we in incorporate it into our lives and is incongruous with the Bible itself. Why? Well, because the Bible has uh, 
that we read now have went through what we call securitous path, and a very perilous one as well. Uh, we have many editions of it. Uh, we have uh, that have gotten away from the original autograph. And so we got copies of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And then of course, along with that, there's what we call scriptural variances. There's redactions, there's interpo interpolations. And so people added what they wanted to add in the New Testament. And part of my job is to expose that and to make you aware of it, it's not to draw you away from the Mashiach, but to draw you closer to him. What the Ruach does, the Ruach objective, is to lead and guide us into all truth, and it is to bear testimony of the ministry of Yahushua HaMashiach. So we must dispel the lies of the New Testament or the interpolations that was inserted in the New Testament. You want to hear? Here you go. Yochanan chapter 6, verse 1. Let's start at verse 1. Our emphasis is going to be on verse 4. Let's make sure you get a mic. Wait, we need to come to the mic. After these things, Yahushua went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Yahushua went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover... And the what? Notice the Passover is in brackets. Anybody notice that? If you got a good Bible, study Bible, you will find that word Passover is in brackets. Now stop there. Mashiach is feeding who? He's getting ready to feed who? The 5,000. My question to you is why in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that after he feeds the 5,000 or he feeds the 5,000 around the feast day of tabernacles. But here he has, he's feeding the 5,000 during what time? What? What? Now, we, that's a, <laughs> that's oxymoronic. We're going to have to reconcile that. Because that makes absolutely no sense. That takes away from the harmonious thread of the Gospels when, you, when the other three says tabernacles, but this says what? Passover. Passover. Continue. A feast of the Jews was nigh. When Yahushua then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? When shall we buy bread? So he begins subsequently to begin to feed the multitude. But why is this inserted in John chapter 6, verse 4, the Passover? when in the other three Gospels is around the Feast of the Tabernacles. Hello. Now, the fact that it's in brackets means that it was added. Copyists and translators, they inserted Passover in John chapter 6, verse 4. So the ministry of Yahushua, as I'm going to elaborate momentarily, was only one year, a little over a year. Because we know it was two to four months after his immersion by his cousin Yochanan the Immerser that it was the first Passover. Mashiach only had two Passovers. One at the beginning of his ministry and one, as we know, as many people call Passion Week, during the time that he was going to die. He spent a whole week in Jerusalem leading up to that. Now we have to be able to substantiate that and justify that through the Tanakh. Because he said in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, I come to fulfill all that was spoken about me 
in the law, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. So we better find that consistency in the Old Testament as well. All right, follow your boy. All right. Now, let's look at the first Passover that he experienced in Yochanan or John chapter 2, verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Yahshua went up to Jerusalem. This was shortly after he was baptized or immersed by Yochanan the Baptist. Then the next Passover, he died. That's consistent with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what we call synoptic gospels. That means they see together. Seeing means together. Optic means to see, like optical, right? Synoptic means they see together. Now, so we know it was about a three and a half, uh, well, many people say it was three and a half years. But there's no harmony in the gospels or the basures when we develop that, that mindset, all right? So if the two Passovers in the basures mark out the vast majority of his ministry, then we can fit together all the feasts. We can know, we can map out and look at in terms of in a chronological order, the life of the Mashiach. So the four Basors, there are, there within the four Basors, we see two Passovers. We see one feast of the tabernacle or Sukkot, and then we see the feast of dedication, which is not a requirement, but we do see the Feast of Dedication. Now that's important that we mention that as well. So we can accurately map out uh, the ministry and the travels of the Mashiach just by the four Gospels or Bersores alone. So notice, John chapter 6 verse 4 is altered and Passover is added. Why? Why is John chapter 6, 4, 6 and 4 sticks out like a sore thumb. Well, number one, because you, you, Mashiach, if it's Passover, that means Mashiach needed to be on his way to Jerusalem. Why isn't Mashiach on his way to Jerusalem? Because he had to fulfill the law. He should have been on his way to Jerusalem. Why? Because according to the law of Moshe, it makes it clear that all males must go to Jerusalem how many times a year? Let's get that in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. Devarim 16 and 16. Three times in a year. How many? Did Mashiach keep the law perfectly? Of course, that's why he is our sacrificial lamb. He had no sin. He did not break the law. He was obedient to the, the commandments of his father. So according to the text, Mashiach should be on his way to Jerusalem. But why isn't he? Continue. Shall all thy males appear before Yah thy Elohim in the place which he shall choose, in the feast of unleavened bread, and in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles. So Feast of Unleavened and Bread includes Passover. We all know that, it includes Passover. So Mashiach should have been on his way to Jerusalem, right? On his way to Jerusalem, but we don't see that, all right? Now, uh, let's go back to John chapter six. Let's just oppose both of these. Let's read it again. After these things, Yahushua went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him. Wait a minute. Why did Yahushua go up to the mountains of Galilee? Galilee is about 20 hours away from Jerusalem. He's going away from Jerusalem, not towards Jerusalem. He's going away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem and Galilee. He's going north of Jerusalem. What is Mashiach doing? Is he purposely and is he intentionally breaking the law of the Most High? Continue. And a great multitude followed him, 
because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Yahusha went up into a mountain. Now the multitude, why, he went up to the mountain. Why isn't the multitude concerned about going to Jerusalem? When all the Yahudim went to Jerusalem during the Passover. Continue. And there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. You see how that sticks out? He talking about him going and ministering to the multitude and going to Galilee. Then they inserted Passover there. Red flag. Because it goes with nothing in the circumference of the text. It's not connected with anything in the text. That's why scripture interpretation is very important. To learn how to study the scriptures. It's nothing connected to the Passover. Continue. When Yahusha then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? So notice that there are only two Passovers. We read one in John chapter two. That's at the beginning of his ministry. And then there's one at the end of his ministry. Wait a minute. So he get immersed by Yochanan, the immerser, to the four months before the first Passover that we read in John chapter 2. If you follow it, the chron chronology of it, follow it chronologically, we find that was two to four months before its first Passover. This had to be his second Passover. He should be going to, on his way to Jerusalem to be crucified to fulfill scriptures. Behold the Lamb of God which take away the sin of the world. But he's not! We've been hoodwinked, bamboozled, ran amok. All right, let's continue, right? So <clears throat> notice that for John 6 and 4 to say that there was a Passover, but for him not even go is a huge incongruity with the text. Y'all see that? Am I the only one seeing that? Okay, I just... I'm human, so every now and then we look for amen affirmation. All right? So, so there are some manuscripts um, in terms of some evidence, right? Um, ancillary, um, or ancil um, ancillary uh, evidence that really points to the fact that Mashiach actually, or that John chapter 6, 4 was added there. Now, how do we know that? Well, there is something called the Nuvum Testamentum. It is the oldest copy of the New Testament. And guess what? John chapter 6, verse 4 is not there at all. And all throughout, it is not there in the Nuvum Testamentum. It's not there. Now, Let's continue. So that's the entire passage isn't there. But there are some that it is there. They're not as old as the, uh, uh, the Nuvum Testamentum. But there are some that is there. And the ones that are there, the word Passover isn't there. It says now approaching or now the feast of the Jew was near. We do not find the word Passover there. In fact, look at the statement by Origen, all right? In Iranius, they said it was consistent with the fact that they had manuscript that did not have Passover in John 6 and 4. John 6 and 4. Now, let's look at some additional evidence to support this. You want to hear? Here you go. Let's look at some additional evidence by looking at precepts. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2. Look at some other corroborating accounts to support this. The Ruach of Yah Elohim is upon me, because Yah has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, 
to proclaim the acceptable year of Yah. Wait a minute, look at this, this evidence. Look at this ancillary evidence. To proclaim the what? Maybe this out. Maybe you all are more vivacious. To do what? To proclaim the acceptable? Two years? Three and a half years. He's going to proclaim the acceptable what? Let's go because Mashiach is quoting Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 61. Now go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. The Ruach of Yah is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the Bessorah to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of Yah. How long? How long? How long? Three years. The acceptable what? Truth hidden in plain sight. That's the danger when you eliminate the Old Testament. All right, let's continue. So why would Mashiach not go to Jerusalem to prepare for Passover? In John chapter 6 verse 4, he's going in the opposite direction, right? And notice that he, he's feeding the 5,000, he's feeding them yeast. And loaves. You'll get that later. So how come when the Pharisees approach him, why didn't they scorn him and say, ah, why aren't you going to Jerusalem? We never see the Pharisees pop up and say, got you now. Because we know that they were accusatory. And they never showed up and say, ah, and accuse him of not going to Passover in Jerusalem. So what is Mashiach doing nearly 18 hours away from Jerusalem during the time of Passover? So if you combine all four of the gospel accounts or the Besora accounts in a chronological order, it's even hard to even find one year of ministry. But somebody told you that uh, Jesus, uh, my Lord uh, and my Savior, uh, he died. Um, before he died, there was three and a half years of great work. Uh, he was a philanthropist. Uh, he was a doctor in those three and a half years. He was a lawyer when I needed a lawyer. He was a mama when I needed a mama. Uh, he was a father to the fatherless in those three and a half years. And that is inconsistent with the Bible. Y'all, I lost my little performance-driven hoop. I've been walking in the truth so long, I, I forgot how to be, be entertaining. I mean, be, create, be innovative. All right, so... <laughs> So we find that the ministry was only a year. Now we got to find that in the Old Testament, don't we? Because everything is built upon the foundation of Torah and the prophets. Everything. So we should be able to find it in the Old Testament somewhere, right? So that means we should find that his ministry is only a year and a half. All right? Year and a half. So if you will, let's look at the, see if it's 62 weeks. But it can be 70. If you're including the work of the Ruach during Shavuot, you can say 70. Now, one of the things you got to understand about prophecy, the Hebrew prophets, they spoke, is not what we call, uh, it, it's not uh, static. It's not isolated. It, it normally speaks about what was, what is, and what is to come. Now, we're going to look at certain language in Daniel chapter 9 to let you know it is to come. That the Messiah lived during the day of Daniel. You don't have to think deep. It's not a metaphysical question. 
No. So it's probably 500 years after Daniel. So when it talks about Messiah in Daniel, is it talking about then, presently, or is it talking about the future if it's 500 years before Mashiach? The what? The what? The what? Let's look at Daniel chapter 9, starting at verse 26. And take your time and let's read together. And after three score and two weeks. So three score and two weeks. How many weeks is that? Three score or score is 20. But it's three score. 60 and then add another two weeks. How many weeks is that? What? What? Let's continue to weed. So after 62 weeks, what shall happen? The Messiah should be what? After 62 weeks, the Messiah should be what? He should be what? But not for himself. Continue. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. They're going to destroy. So after that, we know, obviously, we know what kind of what happened with the temple and all of that. Continue. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in He shall what? For what? One week. Continue. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice. Wait a minute. In the middle of the week, who's going to die? Who? Who? Haven't we been staying? He died on a Wednesday. And the resurrection took place on the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. This is the danger of listening to evangelical theologians. Urban apologia. Want to be apologia apologists who tell you to throw away the Old Testament. The Old Testament is irrelevant and is right in your face. He's going to die in the middle of the week. What's the middle of the week? And he says that it will be 62 weeks. And that lines up with the Bosorahs that he only had. He had two Passovers, one in the beginning of his ministry when he started. And when you count, you almost have almost like, yeah, about a year in 10 weeks of his ministry. When you look at when it's from, from the rooter to the tutor, from the beginning to end, there are 62 weeks. Are you done reading? I'm sorry. And the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, yeah. even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So we don't got time to talk about the fourth century uh, synagogue of Laodicea, uh, but we can go back to Eusebius. Because Eusebius is what put John chapter 6, verse 4, conveniently in that passage. Eusebius was a pawn of Constantinus. And was the whole idea, obviously, to purge anything that was Hebrew. And anything that from this messianic religion by Constantine and his bishops. So before that, you don't see John chapter 64 and none of the manuscripts. Not a one. So forgetting that Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all indicate that the feeding of the thousands happened during the feast or around the feast of the tabernacles. That should be a red flag, blues clues. That should be a red flag. So Yahushua was feeding the multitudes, as I said before, with leaven, barley, and loaves, and the people were not in Jerusalem. There should be some red flags there. So we have, I have a scores and a myriad of evidence that supports the notion that Mashiach ministry was not three and a half years, which is one year and a half or shy of that 
62 weeks. And that's our Hebrew apologetic of the week.